All right. Well, good evening, everybody. How are we doing? Everyone doing all right? Good to see you all. We're going to go ahead and uh, going to go ahead and get started. It's great to have you all here. Um, got a special guest, Sally Torres and Isaac Caro are with us. Going to lead worship tonight. Um, before we do anything, though, we have a special event tonight. Today is Marshall Adams' birthday. In case you guys don't know Marshall, Marshall helps keep all of our tables in line and all of your great table hosts uh, resourcing them, making sure they're taken care of. So every once in a while, we just like to stop, have worship, pause together. As we say, kind of our big metaphor that is we're going to stop and turn our eyes towards Jesus before we get started. So I want to encourage you, whatever kind of day you've had, whatever, you know, if it's been hectic, you've come flying in, whatever it is, let's just stop, pause, and take a breath. So why don't we stand together? Let's focus our hearts and our minds. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for everything you're doing in our hearts. We thank you for everyone joining us online. God, all of these opportunities to come and worship you. So Father, now we turn our eyes towards you. We focus on you. We concentrate on you. We look to you the author and finish of our faith. We love you. We thank you. We come together now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's right. As Pastor Brian said, um, we actually have a new song for to introduce you. We sing this song in our Next Gen ministry. And it's such a beautiful song because we can just reflect in the presence of God. And I don't know how you've come today. I don't know how your day has been. Mine was really hectic. It was really busy. And just to be able to have a moment where we can just reflect and lean on the presence of God is just such a beautiful experience. And I encourage you today, whether you know this song or not, just listen to the lyrics, read them, but participate with us as we sing this song, as we learn this new song together. As Jesus, we thank you, God, for your presence, and we ask that you just be here with us. We cast our cares and our burdens on you in exchange for this moment that we can have with you. We thank you, Jesus. Yes, God. Oh, we sing. How I live for the moment where I'm still in your presence. All noise dies down. Lord, speak to me now. You have all my attention. I will linger and listen. I can't miss a thing. And Lord, I know my heart wants more of you. My heart wants something new. So I surrender all. And all I want is to
worship you, Lord. Oh, 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 oh. I open up my heart to you. I open up my heart to you now. So do Jesus, 
we thank you, God. Oh, we rest on you, Jesus. We cast our cares and our burdens to you, God. presence in this place. We thank you for the freedom to worship you at any moment. We thank you for the freedom to praise you, God, for all the good things and to turn to you, God, when things are confusing or difficult. We thank you that we can call you friend, that we can call you father, that we can call you counselor, teacher. That our peace comes from you, our hope, our strength. You are the source by which we gain life from. So we thank you for these moments where we can just recharge and focus, God, on all the craziness of our lives. And whatever we do, we can focus on you. And we thank you, Jesus, for your love, for your mercy, for your grace. We thank you, God. In your name we pray, amen. Why don't you give God some love? Come on. That's right. Why don't you give the person next to you some love? Tell them, hey, you look good. Give them a high five. That's how we do it at Next Gen. High five. How are you? Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how we doing, everybody? It's good to see all of you here. We've got some friends joining us online. Casey Smith from Minnesota, if you're still there. Hey, Casey. You guys remember Casey, right? I talked about Casey. Casey was our children's pastor at our church plant in Missouri, so it's good to see her. My sister-in-law, Chrissy, was watching for a little bit. Um, this is a coffee cup that we stole from her church, so there we go. <laughs> but it's Whatcom New Life Assembly, so, you know, it's all one big family, right? It's good? Guess it is now. All right. How's everyone doing? Good. Man, is anyone else? I'm hot. I don't know about you. Is it hot in here or is it just me? <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. I've been working out. Everybody have your handouts? Let's get started. Well, we took a little bit of a, of, a, of a detour last week, but I think it was good. Everyone enjoy last week with the, talking about the Bible. I hope you found that beneficial. Um, so as we're talking about these scriptures, and as we're looking at Hebrews, uh, let me just give you a couple things to remember. So now that we're really getting into it, we have to remember that the author is writing to not only Jews, but Hellenistic Jews. In other words, these are Jews, more than likely, we're, we're running off of the premise that they are in uh, Alexandria and northern Egypt, right on, um, right on the, the coast there. And we're, we're working off of that premise that he's writing to them, they're, that they're writing to them. And so what happens is basically these next several sections are deconstruction, if you will, of the things that are sort of important to them. 
In other words, he's going to, the author, he or she is going in there and they're going to be saying, hey, these are the things that you are placing, that you're trying to place above God, and I'm going to prove to you that Jesus is greater than all of them. So a couple weeks ago when we talked about that, the author started with angels, which is interesting because angels are not necessarily a part of the New Testament we're used to. Israel, Israel Jews, or Hebraic, what are called Hebraic Jews, they really didn't make a big deal of that, but the other, the, the, the Jews from around the world did. So that's why Paul has to deal with some form of angel worship probably in the book of Corinthians. These are Hellenized people that, that, are, that are, what's the best way to say this? What they've done is they've synthesized, if you will, and I, again, anybody here take like freshman philosophy in college or anything like that? Okay, here's some freshman philosophy, okay? Essentially what they did is they synthesized Plato's philosophy, Platonic philosophy, that everything was a shadow, everything that existed in reality also existed sort of metaphysically, right? He wrote this thing, uh, Aristotle sort of did it as well, they all sort of build on each other. And philosophically, the idea was that everything that exists physically exists spiritually, and the, and the spiritual things and the physical things are shadows of each other, okay? So what they've done then is, and then in order to penetrate, get past the physical world, and get into the real world, the spiritual world, you had to like learn all like secret passwords, and you were elevating yourself, right? So even when, when John... Uh, when Paul talks about being in, in the seventh heaven on the Lord's day, or John even references it, they're sort of playing on that same idea of these levels of, of these metaphysical layers in the universe. So what the Hellenistic Jews did is they really brought that into their Judaism. They're like, we like that. The Hebraic Jews in Jerusalem and Antioch were like, no, we've got the Bible, like, we're good. We don't need all that. So, but if you pay attention to the Bible... The books that are written to like um, Asia Minor, the books that are written to the Greek world, the books that are written to Turkey, they often are challenging these things. So Colossians deals with you need to have a better perspective about angels. Um, Corinthian deals with you need to have a better perspective about angels. John, the, the Gospel of John written to Greek believers in Ephesus, he starts out with a platonic concept. In the beginning was the Logos. The Logos, the word, is translated in your English Bibles. Thank you, last week. But the Logos was, it was a Greek term. It was a Platonic term. Plato said that the Logos was the thing that sort of, it transcended the whole universe. And it was the thing that sort of bound the universe together. And it was like everything that came through the universe came through the Logos. And it was all there. So John gets up and says, yes, the Logos existed, and it was the Son of God. And I'm going to tell you the real story of the Logos. And so what they're doing is they're always pulling in. So rather than push against it and challenge it and say, no, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, these biblical authors will always say, okay, you want to believe that, let me show, let me lean into that and show you why the path of Jesus is always better. So I will take your culture, if you will, I'll take your belief system, and I'm going to lean into it just a bit, just so I can sort of put Jesus over the top of it. There's a book by an author, I'm actually sort of reintroducing it into my own life right now, uh, by an author named Reinhold Niebuhr. And Reinhold Niebuhr talks about this idea, it's, it's called Christ in Culture. And it talks about the different ways that Christianity has dealt with culture. And one of those expressions of Christianity and culture is Christ through culture, and then Christ over culture. And Hebrews is an awesome example of taking Christ, taking the culture that you have, and saying, you kind of do see Jesus a little bit in it, so let me turn your culture down, turn Jesus up, and you realize he's been there the whole time. And I love that. Like, that's one of the things that I absolutely love. I love it when it happens in Scripture. Believe it or not, it happens all the time. Paul loved to do it. We don't know, because it's Paul, and it's like the Bible. And so we just think, oh, they thought that all the time. No, Paul was it. When Paul in Acts is on Mars Hill, when he's on the Areopagus, he literally quotes pagan poets and says, your own poets have said, in him we live and move and have our being. That was pagan poetry. And he says, you guys are close, you're so close, you're already there. Now let me tell you who the in him is. It's Jesus. And we sing it now. In him we live and move and have our being. In him we live. Anyone know that? 
Nothing is too difficult for the world. Anybody? Come on. Surely somebody's out there knows it. it am, I, am I on an island by myself right here? OK, all right, OK. You're like, this. everyone in the crowd's like, um, we already had the singing part? We're kind of here for the Bible part, so let's not, let's not get that. What's that? What's, we're switching out? Oh, I, it, does it sound? What's going on? I can hear me. Oh, there's interference. It's, it's, uh, it's because Colin Powell's son sold everything to the FCC. We'll be back. Hey, don't, don't give up. Don't click away. There we are. We're coming back. OK, we're back. Everyone's really worried. It's like the Last Supper. Is it I, Lord? Is it I? No, they were saying we had some interference, so we're back. So we have this idea then. So the author of Hebrews has done the same thing. So the reason why I say all that is we don't, we don't get the angel thing. You don't see it a lot unless they're dealing, typically unless they're dealing with Greeks. But now that they're dealing with Greek, Hellenistic Jews that have been so heavily influenced by Greek culture, remember that they had their own Greek translation of the Old Testament. They didn't even read the Old Testament in Hebrew. They read it in Greek. So the author says, okay, I will meet you where you're at. You guys think angels are awesome? Makes no sense. The sun is greater than angels. The messenger is greater than the, like, like the, the, the message is greater than the messenger. And in Christ, he is both the message and the and the messenger, therefore, he is greater. Now he was made, again, I'm, I'm sort of recapping because we, skipped, we sort of skipped a week. He was made a little lower than the angels, but just for a bit. But the whole time he was higher, but he was made lower so that he could identify with us. And even in the rabbinical tradition that said the angels were actually instructed to honor mankind so that in a weird way, we're actually, in God's eyes, a little higher than the angels. We may not be as glorious beings as they are, but we are, in fact, in God's eyes, more critical, if that makes sense. In the same way that we are a little higher than animals, except cats, but we're a little higher than animals. Well, that's what cats think. Um, I really want to bring my cat one night and just leave him here, like, the whole time. He would stay there the whole time. Um, so, so that's what he's saying. So now he gets in, he says, okay, so I've deconstructed the Moses thing. He says, but now let me talk to you about somebody else that you guys, you Jewish Christians, think is a really big deal. Let's talk about Moses. And you really couldn't get any bigger than Moses. There's really only one name to the Jewish culture that would have been bigger than Moses, and that would have been Abraham. And he says, I'll get to Abraham in a minute. <laughs> Paul actually does a pretty good job taking care of Abraham. James takes care of the other. There's three. There's Moses, Abraham, and Elijah. And if you look, each of these different authors sort of demystifies each one of them. Paul in Romans deals with Abraham. The author of Hebrews deals with Moses. And James deals with Elijah in one sentence. Elijah was a man just like we are. So awesome. Anyway, all right. You should have taken James. Um, let's get into it. Turn your copy of Scripture, uh, whether digital or physical. Why don't you go ahead and point it to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a hovering calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. The apostle and the high priest of our confession. The author of Hebrews is introducing this dual dance that he'll do when he describes Jesus. A apostle, high priest. Author, finisher. He's playing, he's trying to say that Jesus is all of it. Like, Jesus is all of it. Jesus is really both the messenger and the message. He is the, high, he is the apostle, the sent one. He is the one who brings the message, but he's also the high priest. He is the means by which the message is enacted. If you really want to get preachy and give it a good turn of phrase, he is both the revelation and the reconciliation. He is both. And the reason Jesus is constantly put up as better is because he's doing the one thing that all those great people couldn't do. And we'll build on that. 
Jesus, it says, who was faithful and who appointed him just was Moses, was also faithful in all God's house. Now, he's not dissing on Moses. He says, no, Moses was faithful. Moses is worth your honor. Moses is a guy that's worth us celebrating and paying attention to. But Jesus, verse 3, has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. And this is such a powerful metaphor. Just as the glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. Now think about that. He's doing kind of an apologetic. Why should you stay? Remember, they're under persecution, they're under pressure, they're under temptation to ditch Jesus and either go back to paganism or go back to Judaism. And he's saying, you can't go back because what are you going to go back to? Moses, why would you go back to the house when you have a chance to be with the builder of the house? Like, why would you just, why would you venerate, why would you obsess on a structure when you can have relationship with the one who built the structure? Paul picks up the same argument in Romans 1, by the way. He says they exchanged, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and exchanged creation for the creator. As awesome as Moses was, and I'm sure he was a nice guy, although he did have a bit of a temper and he killed those guys, but beyond that, he was really cool. And then he disobeyed and had to die in the wilderness. But beyond those two little bumps, he was great. As awesome as he was, he's saying he's still part of us. So he is in limitation. You can't go back to Moses because Moses is just one of us. He says, for every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in God's house. I love this, so powerful. Moses was faithful in God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. It is the re-emphasis, it's the validation of the words of the Old Testament to reveal God's plan to us. I want to keep saying that because I've encountered, we've talked a little bit about it, we've encountered some of that teaching that says the Old Testament's not valid. Look, they're constantly referencing the validity of the Old Testament to point us to Jesus. It says he was faithful. He testified. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. He's the son of God. Moses was a servant of God. Jesus is the son of God. And just, the logic just stands. Why would you honor a servant and not honor the son? Yes, the servant's faithful. Yes, the servant told you great things. But you can actually have the son. Like, you can be a part of the family. They are both faithful. And he said, and indeed, we are his house. We are his house. Verse 6, if we hold faithful, full fast, excuse me, our confidence and our boasting in hope. Now, I want to take just a second and deal with an aside here really quick. One of the themes that comes out in Hebrews is the idea of walking away from faith. Now, this is actually a somewhat divisive and, and even a little bit of a controversial subject in Christian tradition. It is, as Calvin called, the um, perseverance... of the saints. Has anyone ever heard this, of, of this theology? Any Reformed, any Calvin, any former Calvinists, any Lutherans, any Presbyterians? Okay. It's, a, it's this idea, if you've ever heard of Calvinism, Calvinism or Reformed theology is caught up in a really bad English translation of Calvin's theology called TULIP, and it's how you play out his theology. The P is perseverance of the saints. The idea behind this is that once someone is redeemed by God, they're locked in. No matter what they do, no matter who they are, no matter, honestly, and even what they do in that point, they can never walk away from the redemption of God. They can never walk away from God. And, and they find that in scriptures, you know, nothing can separate us from the love of God. They find it in Jesus saying, no one can pluck you out of the Father's hand. Like, all, that's where they would, they would point to that and they would say. They would say that God does not... Um, God's election is, is without repentance, like that sort of thing. Some of you may have heard of this theological doctrine in the form of these words, eternal security. Has anyone ever heard that phrase? Okay? So, people ask me all the time, do you believe in eternal security? And I give them my answer, it depends. Ish. Do I believe that somebody could come along and rip me out of God's love? Absolutely not. Do I believe 
that someone could come along and just say, hey, bro, you're not saved anymore. Well, they say that all the time. But, but um, <laughs> do I believe that just because someone, they can't, like, do I believe that God could lose me like, like a set of keys? <laughs> like, oh, where did I put Brian? <laughs> There's an app for that. <laughs> and a lot of people hold to this. And so, and so you'll say, well, what about the people who were like baptized and they became a Christian and then they walked away and now they're sinning and they're obviously rejecting God and their answer is always the same. Well, they were never really saved in the first place. And I'm like, well, that's convenient. I don't know if that's true. Now, I was raised in a completely other context, which was this. You come down, a youth group, great altar service, you prayed, all that kind of stuff, and you, bro, oh, bless God, and God, to give me life, I want to repent, I want to repent, you get all, your, get all cleaned up, get all sin, and then some well-meaning youth pastor, youth leader would say, now you better live right, because you don't want to get hit by a car on your way out, and if you die, because you, you sinned and you said a bad word, you go to hell, and I'm like, okay, that seems a little much. So some of you may have been raised in eternal security, I was raised in eternal insecurity. Is that right? Ish. My question, I don't even want to challenge the theology, I just want to do an aside. My question is this. If it's not possible that I could walk away from God's grace, that I could, through decision and unction and pride and arrogance and rebellion, walk away from the grace of God, if that's not possible, then why is the Bible always warning against it? The book of Hebrews starts, and it comes up again and again and again in the book of Hebrews. We will. We are his house, F and F, conditional, if we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. The author of Hebrews seems to suggest that there is a scenario in which someone could say, after receiving the grace and the glory of God, perhaps they could say, no thank you. And the author of Hebrews is desperately warning, don't do that, because there's nothing else there. You can't go back. And some of us, we struggle in Christian faith, particularly maybe some of those of you who are relatively new to Christian faith. You heard the story, I heard the story just today of this young lady baptized just last year, or earlier, yeah, no, last year. She baptized last year. She's sharing her story, and she talked about, right after she was baptized, as bad as her life had been up to that point, she got baptized, and then life just got worse. And so what does she think? Like, the struggle is there. The temptation is there. I can't do this because I just should. This isn't working, so I should just go back. And the author of Hebrews says, no, 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 no. Just, you, there's nothing to go back to. You've walked up these ladders. You've walked up the ladders of the law. You've walked up the ladder of the prophets. You've walked up the ladder of the teachers. You are now looking, and now you not only have you walked up the ladder, but now you have walked through the cross of Christ. Where do you go next? You cannot go back. So just as an aside, I just wanted to talk about that. We can process that a little bit more. But this idea that we, now, should we live in fear? Please, I, if some of, I know what some of you, what just happened. Some of you just got really scared. All of you pleasers, like, you're, like you're, you're people pleasers, and if you're a people pleaser, you're like a God pleaser. And you're like, oh man, uh, that time in, in, uh, during the Reagan administration when I stubbed my toe <laughs> and I said that mommy-daddy word, um, God, like, is that going to be held against me? No, that's, that's not how it works either. We're not meant to live in fear. We're meant to live aware. That's not the same thing. So I, I, I really struggle with even talking about that. Because what I don't want is that fear. Well, how do I know? How do I know? People say, well, how do I know? How do I know if I've lost it? Well, number one, you didn't lose it. You set it aside. Those are not the same thing. Right? I lose stuff a lot. Right? It's just the way my brain works. I put something down. I never put anything. I lose it. There's one thing to say, I have lost, you know, I lost that book. There's another thing to say, I don't want that book anymore. Do you see the difference? 
One is just, uh, that's not how it works, but through our actions, through our decisions, I wonder, all of a sudden do we look up and say, I'm a lot farther from God than I realized. And maybe unintentionally, or intentionally, I've walked away. But here's the amazing thing about God. We, God is here, right? And we draw closer to him, and we see God, and we're like, God, 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 thank you, thank you. And, we, and life, the law, the prophets, the revelation, the witness of friends, all the kind of stuff, and we're being drawn. And finally, we meet God, and we say, thank you, Jesus, I give you my life. And then we get distracted, we get angry, we get, we, we get uncertain, we move all these things. We become like the... Um, like in the parable of, of the seed and the sower, our heart gets taken over, all these sort of things, and we walk away, we walk away and realize, oh, and then perhaps we have that revelation, oh, I'm far from God, and we turn around and we expect to see God way over there, but when I turn around, he's right there. He's right there. Every step. And I don't want anyone to ever say, oh, I lost, no, 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 that's not how it works. But Paul says, or, or the author of Hebrews says, just if you think that the, pro- the solution to your problems is giving up on Christ and finding a different way, the author is saying, my friends, there is no better way. Amen. There's no better way. And perhaps it's a challenge to some of you tonight. Whether you're here, whether you're watching online, whether you're watching this at a later date um, through the app or, or at a Bible study or whatever, and you're saying, man, it just, it was so easier before. It's just easier when I didn't feel bad about things. It was easier when no one was telling me to, to want more for my life. It was easier when no one was asking me to be an usher. It was just easier. And my friend, it wasn't. It wasn't. So, we're establishing the idea of Moses, and we're establishing the idea of faithfulness. So he says, for example... Um, you shouldn't reject Moses because rejecting, or actually says this, rejecting Jesus is actually worse than rejecting Moses. And he leans into the, the, the metaphor of the Exodus. Okay? So one of the things about the Exodus is there was a group of people in the Exodus that tried to, they're like, we want to go back to Egypt. This is horrible. And they, they tried to go, and the ground swelled them up, but that's Old Testament. But, um, yeah, they, there's this, and then they went there, and then, and it was really bad. Um, but he says this, chapter 3, verse 12, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to what? Fall away from the living God. But encourage, exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today. I love that. What day should you encourage someone today? What's the best day to send someone a note saying you can make it? today. What's the best time to say, I got your back, bro. Let's pray together. Let's get you through this today. What's the best day to reach out to someone and say, hey, we've missed you on Tuesdays, or to reach out to someone and say, hey, I haven't seen you at New Life in a few weeks. What's the best day? Today. Any day that ends with a Y is the right day to encourage someone. As long as you have it, as long as it's present, as long as there's breath, encourage one another. For who were those, verse 16, who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? I love this because he's kind of throwing shade at Moses. Like, if Moses was so good, how come people quit? That's a little tough. But anyway, and whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? Verse 19, so we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief belief. So it's this idea that we have in the same way that the children of Israel were freed from Egypt via the Exodus, we are freed from sin via the work of Christ. Everyone following me so far? And the Exodus was a journey to what? The promised land, a place of rest. Therefore, just as we have been led on an Exodus of sin, out of the bondage of sin, our own spiritual Egypt, we are also being led by a higher prophet, a better leader, a better Moses, to a place of rest. Does that make sense? So that's what what the author's saying. He's saying, look, just pay attention. Follow the metaphor. But if you are not, if you are unfaithful, 
just as people who left Egypt and in between Egypt and the promised land fell away because of unbelief, he said, you can't give up like they did. You have to persevere. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, verse 4, let us fear, let us fear lest any of you should, should seem to have failed to reach it. I don't want you to be afraid. The author really wants you to be afraid. So I'm just, I'm too nice. I'm a little nicer. So just, you know, hang in there. Um, for good news came to us, just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Now, this is interesting. He's saying united with faith to the others who listened. The author of Hebrews is now introducing a new tool to help us persevere. One is faith in Christ. The other is community with each other. He said it twice now. When do you encourage each other? Every day. How did they get there? What happened to the people who fell away? They were not united by faith with those who listened. They weren't in community. And so we have entered this rest. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my mouth, it goes on and on. All that to say, he, he starts to establish this idea of rest. Rest becomes important. Rest becomes this metaphor. Rest is not salvation. Rest is reward. Rest is important. Verse 4, for he is somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way. God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who had formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, he says again, today. So what's he saying is this. He's saying there, again, he's talking to Jews, so this is critical. He's using the metaphor of the Exodus. They were promised a rest because God rested. I just want you to follow sort of this, he, uh, this Hellenistic logic train here. They were promised rest. Why is rest important? God rested. Follow me and you will enter that rest. I have brought you to the promised land and entered into rest. But, he says this, if Joshua, verse 8, had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So, the author of Hebrews is playing this amazing rhetorical trick here because he's saying, you have to understand, Israel is not the rest God was talking about. Your faithfulness, your, 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 your need for faithfulness to the covenant of, Christ, of covenant of God is not over. Simply because the Jews, our forefathers, landed in the promised land, their rest had not yet come. There is another rest. And that's the rest you're in danger now, Hebrew friends, of losing. We got the one rest, the promised land, and we kind of mucked that up. But that wasn't the rest that he was talking about the whole time. It was a shadow of the rest to come. So he leans into that platonic idea. He's using that platonic idea of philosophy. He's saying, yes, there was a physical land of rest. But guys, there is another greater rest. And if you don't persevere just because your forefathers made it into the physical land of rest, it doesn't mean that you will make it into the eternal rest. It's incredibly powerful. So in verse 11, chapter 4, verse 11, he says, Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and of discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from its sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So you're like, where did that come from? It's simply this. He's saying, the word of God came to you, and the word of God is challenging you, and the word of God will hold you accountable, and the word of God is so sharp, it gets right down into the division of soul and spirit. Do you know what the division of soul and spirit is? There isn't one. People read that, oh, okay, there's like soul and spirit and bone and marrow. And no, 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 don't over overgod, don't complicate it. You can't separate them, but the word of God is so precise. It, it, it knows what's going on in here. And just because you're observing, just because you look good, just because you're, quote-unquote, doing it right, what's going on in here? Because the Word of God, that's getting to there, the author of Hebrews is saying. 
And you have to listen to it. You have to read it. You have to be encouraged by it. Remember, faith in the Son gets us there. Trust and encouragement and community helps get us there. Openness and commitment now to the Word of God helps get us there. The author, as, he's, as, as, as the author is saying, don't give up, don't give up, they're slipping in all of these tools to help along the journey. Your faith in Christ, don't give up. Your community to each other, don't give up. Your commitment to the Word of God, don't give up. Hang on to these things and you will make it. We have to keep on striving. We have to keep on being faithful because God's Word will call us into account, as I've written in your notes. God's Word will call us in. Once you've walked to it, he'll say this a little bit later on, but essentially, once you've walked up to it, you can't walk away from it. Once you know what you know, you can't unknow the truth of God. There's a lot of things. I'm 45 years old. I've forgotten a lot. And I try to help my daughter, my 10-year-old daughter, with math. And I'm like, I don't remember that. that that's weird. That's not real math. That's odd math. I don't know what, I don't know what they're teaching in these schools nowadays. How old are you? Um, and I, you, you, you just you forget it, right? There's stuff that you've learned that you've forgotten. I can't remember words to songs. I can't remember, you know, uh, and, and then you remember weird stuff. Like, I, I, I remember weird things. Like, I, I, I have an inappropriate ability to quote, like, movie lines. <laughs> but then I can't remember the books of the Bible in order. Like, that's a problem. <laughs> like, literally, guys, some of you know this is the big Bible. If you remember from the last class, this is the, I'm getting serious, Bible. I have tabs to let me know where the books of the Bible are. I don't know. People are like, remember the song. I'm like, I can't remember the list if I can't remember the song. Like, I, I, like if I have to alphabetize something, I'll go, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, 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 J, J! <laughs> but the Word of God's not like that. Once we walk up to the truth of God, you don't forget it. Oh, you may forget what's this verse say, or oh, where's that found? And I do it all the time, because you guys are my friends, I'll let you into one of my little tricks. If you ever hear me preaching or teaching, and I say something like, Paul says, it's because I can't remember where he says it. <laughs> the Old Testament teaches us. I mean, there's, 30, there's 39 books. Like, surely one of them is going to be right. Uh, that, yeah, yeah, or, or yeah, and then sometimes math right. The Bible says. <laughs> the Bible says, early to bed and early to rise. Makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. No, that was Ben Franklin. Um, <laughs> But yet, something happens when I uncover the truth of God, and I can't walk away from it. The blood of Christ stains me. It leaves a stain on me. And the Word of God is so powerful. It's as though, and so precise and so sharp, it's as though it can even separate the inseparable in our lives. That's how sharp it is. And I have to remember that it has cut me deep at some point. That at some point in my life, I realized that I was a sinner separated from God and that the only one who could close that gap was Jesus. And although I may want to give up and I may say, oh, I could live a better life of philosophy, I could live a better life, for me it was a better life of reason and science. Oh, I, I'll just walk away and I'll find a better way. And the author of Hebrews is saying, no, you've been cut deep. You've been cut so deep and the blood of Christ has been shed on you and it has stained you. You can never forget that. You can't walk away from it. And again, I'll say it, and I will probably say it every week for several weeks, because there's nowhere else to go. There's just nowhere else to go. So I want to encourage you, when you're talking uh, in your groups, when you're trying to encourage each other, just say, Jesus, I, I, I'm struggling, but I want to keep walking with you. And I want to say this, just so for the sake of saying it, right? If you feel like you are far from God, if you feel like maybe you've, paid, you've lost track, just turn around. That's it. It's not complicated. It's not fancy. Well, I don't know if God will ever forgive me. I can answer that question. He will. Oh, Brian, you don't know what I've done. You're right, and I really don't want to. <laughs> I, I want to keep liking you. 
But it doesn't matter. Oh, Brian, if you only knew. I don't know. God knows. And you know what? He still wants to forgive you. He seeks it. Did you know that? It is God's will that all would come to repentance. That is the will of God. Every single one of us. Brian, all have sinned and fallen short and are freely justified through the gift of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to close in prayer. You guys are going to get in your groups or if you're watching online or if you're watching later on, you're going to be talking or hopefully connecting with someone. Ask through those questions. Maybe tonight or whenever you're, you're, you're consuming this, whenever you're a part of it, if you're struggling and you feel safe, just share it. Just say, hey, I'm, I'm struggling. And let's, let's do exactly what it says. Encourage each other, one another, every day, as long as it is called today. What's the best day to do it? Today. Today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are and what you do in our lives. We thank you for how much you love us. God, thank you for bringing us together. God, let us be encouraged. Let us be faithful. Let us be steadfast. Let us walk with you. Let us hold fast to the truth of, of your word, and let us hold fast to our commitment of faith. Let us always keep, even in our failure, keep seeking Jesus. We love you. We thank you. We do all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, God bless you. Thanks, Facebook, for joining us. Travis is going to cut it off. You guys, hit your tables. Table leaders, you got